This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. I want to welcome all of you to another edition of Silent Voices. Uh, beside me is Maria Malin, and we're at the Capitol in Lansing, Michigan today for a special edition of Silent Voices. Maria, why are we here? We're here to bring attention to child abuse that takes place, court-licensed court abuse, and children that are in general placed in abusive homes. Um, we're standing up for the children, and we hope to have a really good turnout today here in Lansing, Michigan. Let's go to a few of the sights and sounds of uh, the rally here in Lansing. Okay, first off, we just want to thank everybody for uh, coming out today. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good crowd. Uh, we're here today to give our children, including those that have already become angels, a voice. And now I'm gonna, we're going to introduce ourselves that uh, was on the panel. I'm Cheryl Scott, and I'm Dominic's Warriors. Hello, my name is Erica Hamill, and I am the mom behind Wyatt's Law, um, which are the house bills listed on the sign in front, and uh, I'll have Representative Roberts. Uh, good, ap good afternoon, I'm State Representative Sarah Roberts, and I worked with Erica very closely on creating Wyatt's Law. Bridget? I'm Bridget Habit and Cuff. I'm here in support of Wyatt's Law to tell my story and how it affected our family. This is my daughter, Taylor. I'm Taylor Habit Inc. and I'm here to, in support of Wyatt's Law. Barbara? I'm Barbara Kelsey. I'm here in support of child abuse uh, advocates and to bring awareness. <laughs> All right, I am standing here today being Dominic Calhoun's voice, who became an angel on or April 12, 2010. In Dominic's name, I will be his voice. On April 8, 2010, while Dominic was eating his breakfast on the couch, he had an accident. This was the beginning of Dominic's abuse, torture, and sadly, his death. <clears throat> Dominic was removed from life support and passed away on April 12, 2010. Dominic would still be here today if someone would have gotten involved. Including his mother who did nothing. And sadly this happens way too often. After Dominic's passing, the Calhoun family began working feverishly to implement a new law called Dominic's Law. In June of 2012, Dominic's Law was finally passed and put into the law books. The law passed the House with 107 to 0 votes. <laughs> the House bills are 5562 and 55. Six, three. The bill calls for stiffer penalties on first and second degree child abuse, along with harsher punishment for those who commit abuse in front of other children. Unfortunately, because Dominic was murdered before Dominic's law, neither Corrine or Brandon could be tried under it. So Corrine made a plea deal and turned evidence against Brandon Hayes and was sentenced to 13 to 30 years for assisting with the trial. And Brandon received two life sentences plus 140 years. So today we've come together to raise our voices 
so we can be heard. Stop child abuse. We will not be silenced. And our children matter. Rick, go. So right now, I'm going to... Are you speaking? Yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. Go Representative Roberts. Representative Roberts would like to say a few words. Thank you, and, and good afternoon, and uh, thank you to everyone who made the trip up here to Lansing. Uh, this is the people's capital, and all of the uh, state representatives like myself and the state senators and the governor are, are truly here to represent the, the will and the wants of the people. And unfortunately, too many times, uh, th those needs and, and your desires fall on deaf ears. Um, I'm only going to speak for a few minutes. I have to go into session that started at 12 o'clock, so I'm sorry to leave you, but that is why. Um, I am going to be introducing and passing a resolution today making April uh, 2016 Child Abuse Awareness Month. Um, and so we will be passing that today to help raise awareness. Thank you. You know, the sad fact is, is we are seeing increases in child abuse here in the state of Michigan and we should be doing everything that we can to stop child abuse before it happens. Um, soon here you'll be uh, hearing from Erica Hamill. She is a constituent of mine. We both live in St. Clair Shores, Michigan and she contacted me you know, as her state representative to share her story um, about her son Wyatt and, and what happened. Um, and so we worked together for months and months uh, to come up with uh, legislation called Wyatt's Law. And its intent is really to stop, to help stop child abuse before it happens. Um, Erica went, and she's gonna, I'm sure, share her story, but really did everything she could um, to stop, um, a, you know, a potential abuse from happening, which ended up happening. And she tried to find out information um, on somebody that she thought could and possibly would and ended up um, abusing her son Wyatt. So our legislation would create a public registry where individuals could search for people who have been convicted of child abuse. And what this will do is help ensure and create a safety, a safety measure so that if someone is convicted of child abuse, then an individual has the ability to have proof to stop interaction between their child and this, inter and, uh, this individual. Uh, we are working hard to pass this legislation into law. It's actually three pieces of legislation, but combined create why it's law. Uh, but we really need your help. We um, have not been able to get a hearing or a vote on this legislation out of committee. We need you and your friends and your family um, other people throughout Michigan to contact their state representatives, their state senators, the governor, and particularly Representative Kesto, who is the chairman of the committee where these bills uh, lay um, without getting a hearing. So you being here today um, is a part of the advocacy effort and the push that we're all working on to get Wyatt's Law passed into law. We're not going to be able to do it without you. Um, but we need people to do more. We need to build public pressure to convince the chair and frankly the Republican Party who is the party in control. I mean that's just the fact. It's not about making it partisan. It's not a Republican or Democratic issue. But when a party is in charge they get to decide what gets a vote and what doesn't. Right? And we need to put pressure on them to bring this into a vote and to get Wyatt's Law passed into law and I just thank you so much for the opportunity to share this with you and to fight this fight with you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Roberts. Uh, I truly, when people talk about their state rep and writing their state representative, I get a lot of times that they, oh, they'll never listen to me. And that's not true because Sarah listened to me and Sarah's been along this whole way with my fight and this wouldn't have happened without her. So I'm so thankful and will always be thankful to her for this. Um, my name is Erica Hamill. Um, I am the mom behind uh, Wyatt and Wyatt's Law. Uh, my, I, I was married when I was 22. Thought I, I was really excited about getting married early in life. Planned to have a family. We had Wyatt. 
Wyatt was a planned child. When Wyatt was about five months old, life turned a, another direction, and uh, my ex-husband left me and left us. Uh, it was very shocking, unexpected. I ended up finding out he was having an affair with a woman named Rachel Edwards. Uh, Rachel Edwards rubbed me the wrong way when I met her. I just had this instinctive feeling that something wasn't right. We had our custody hearing in the summer of 2013. I had searched her on Google. I had searched her on Otis, which is the offender tracking information system. I even searched her on the sex offender registry and I could find nothing to prove in court that she was a threat to my son. So the judge granted a joint custody agreement. So my ex-husband had overnights with her. Um, I did not know my son was being left with her. He was told being uh, left with his, with his grandmother at the time, but um, Wyatt celebrated his first birthday, October 12th, 2013. On November 1st, 2013, I got a call from Wyatt's father that he had been rushed to Children's Hospital. When I got to the hospital, uh, neurosurgery pulled me aside and told me his injuries were a right subdural hematoma, which is a major brain bleed, fractured skull, bilateral retinal hemorrhages, which is bleeding behind the eyes, and a fractured skull. I was an absolute, try not to cry. To see your child on life support, to see your child with all those tubes on him, it's, it's a picture I will never get out of my head. And the fact of the matter is after we found out everything with Wyatt, we found out that his abuser, which was Rachel Edwards, she had shaken him. It was shaken baby syndrome. And um, she had a criminal history. She had been convicted twice before of child abuse, one in 2011, third degree child abuse, and uh, one in 2013, just a couple weeks before she almost killed my son of third degree child abuse. It infuriated me and made me sick to my stomach that my instincts were true and that I, when searching for this woman, I found nothing. I felt really, I, I felt I needed to do something, and I was really frustrated in the fact that no child abuser registry where if you physically abuse a child, uh, you were put on a registry like a pedophile would. I was really frustrated that nothing like that exists because as we know, people that are abusers are more likely to take the show to abuse again. And um, Ms. Edwards was sentenced to 33 months to 10 years. She will be up for parole in March. Um, my whole feeling behind this is if we can't keep these people behind bars, we have to let the public know about them. We have to let parents, grandparents, guardians, um, as this piece of information so we can continue to help protect our children. Uh, the Free Press just did an article that Michigan has, um, the, the report came out on child abuse that they do every year and we are at a 25 year high. It's the high, child abuse rates are the highest they've been in 25 years here in the state of Michigan. So what we have in place is not working and it needs to change. Um, I'm here today to not only spread awareness for Child Abuse um, Prevention Month, but I'm also here to get the attention of Representative Clint Casto with the Judiciary Committee because that's where our three bills sit. House Bill 4973, 4974, and 4975. It's a three bill package that make up why it's law. And I um, definitely want to, um, to say that, you know, this is, a, this is an abuse registry for convicted child abusers. You have to be convicted in a court of law. It's not something CPS can put you on. You have to be charged and convicted in a court of law of child abuse one through four. Uh, so I know there, um, there's been some you know, worries about, about other things with CPS, but no, CPS has nothing to do with this. This is, just has to do with being in a court of law. Um, as you know, child abuse is a cycle and those who are abused are more likely to commit crimes in the future and I just feel like we need to stop this cycle. I feel like we need to stop protecting these abusers, stop letting them roam the streets and hide behind their crimes for them to abuse other children. Um, Representative Castro told me in one of his emails that protecting children was a top priority of his. Well, if it was a top priority of his, I wonder why, why it's law isn't a top priority of his, because it should be. Um, children do not have a voice. My son could not fight back. My son could not defend himself. He could not say what was going on. Children under three are, the, the highest number of deaths are children under three simply because they can't defend themselves. 
Um, I believe this law could change so many lives and livelihoods and save so many lives and livelihoods of children all over. Um, I don't want any child to endure what Wyatt's had to go through. He's had six surgeries, four of them being brain surgeries. He has permanent brain damage and continues out intensive outpatient rehab. I don't want any parent to have to go through what I've gone through. With the divorce rates as high as they are, with breakups happening, we just need to know better about who's around our children. Um, Albert Einstein once said, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. And I, uh, Wyatt's Law would be a piece of information that would give us the power of knowledge, and I truly believe that with this, this, this legislation, we can uh, drop that, that rate of child abuse in the state of Michigan. So thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to introduce um, Taylor Havanek. She's going to give a speech. Taylor is, um, was a victim of child abuse. Um, she is going to speak about her story and her support for Wyatt's Law. So, Taylor. There are many issues that can be debated between political parties. Wyatt's Law should not be one of them. Unless the people opposing this law can look me, my sister, Wyatt, and any other child abuse victim in the eye and tell us that we aren't worth protecting, then there is no reason for ch the child abuse registry to not become law. So I have a question for the Judiciary Committee. Why hasn't Wyatt's Law been passed? I understand that there are arguments about budget. But what about things such as the failed Wayne County Jail that is costing taxpayers over a million dollars a month but is not benefiting anyone? If you took all of the children that have been abused in the state of Michigan, they would fill that lot and more. So what would you choose? The useless steel frame or the lives of the thousands of children? Would they be as easy to ignore if they were standing in front of you? The estimated cost of the child abuse registry is about $1.3 million a year, the same as the sex offender registry. Just think of how many lives could be saved in that year. This is a matter of priority. I grew up with the idea that if something was wrong and you were in danger, you called the police. I had a very basic view of good guys and bad guys, but once my mom filed for divorce and was fighting to keep us safe, that changed for me. My family was failed by the system. I called the police several times, and every single time, they left my sister and me with our father. We called DHS, but we continued to have forced visitation. We tried to get help and were called liars for two and a half years. My mom was sent to the ER with injuries so bad she was on crutches. I was brought to the hospital for a sprained back and later a concussion. My younger, my younger sister witnessed all of these things and was also called a liar. I testified against Andrew Habit Inc. three times before he pled guilty. Three times that I was cross-examined by his lawyer, who called me a liar every chance that he got, while my dad sat behind him glaring at me, with all of his family by his side. We were told that it was our fault for provoking him. My grandma told us that adults just get angry sometimes. My mom had a phone call with a police officer who told us that we should just, just get past it. The same police officer who refused to charge him. The effects of these events were not only physical. After more interviews, authorities, and pressure, I had reached an unbearable point of hopelessness. Two weeks before I started high school, I attempted suicide. The impact of everything that had happened during the abuse and the divorce is something that will always stay with me. It changed me, and there is no going back. All I can do is work through it and use my experiences to make others aware, and that is why I am speaking here today. I was promised by the prosecutor's office that they would fight for me and that he would pay for what he had done. Yet his charge started out a felony and he was able to plead it down to a misdemeanor. He got off with two years of probation, no contact, and 22 evenings in jail with work release. That means that this December we will be back in court fighting to stay away from him. Even after all of this, his record is not in a searchable public system. There is no way to search his name and see what he did to his own children. Andrew Habedank is a fairly successful businessman. He makes a six-figure salary and drives a company car. He wears nice suits and ties. Who would ever suspect him as a child abuser? Here lies the biggest issue. You cannot look at someone and tell if they are a criminal. You cannot let yourself think that you would be able to pick a convicted child abuser out of a lineup. This registry could give that information. It could give people the power to protect their children. All that I am asking is that you support this registry. It could save so many children and give forced accountability to criminals that really have none. Is that a worthy enough cause, Governor Snyder? Is it important enough for your attention and support, Representative Kesto? 
I want to know why there is any opposition to Wyatt's law. I will not stay scared and quiet, because I am not only here to speak for myself. I also speak for my sister, and for all of the kids that have been hurt because the knowledge that their parents needed was not available. I speak for Wyatt, because he can no longer speak for himself. I know that Wyatt's law couldn't have saved me, but it could have saved children. It could have saved anyone in the future path of my abuser. And it has the ability to save countless kids in the future. Thank you. probably shouldn't have planned to follow that today. Hello and thank you all for coming today for such an important cause. My name is Bridget Habedank Huff and I'm here to support Wyatt's Law because of my own experiences as an abused child and then as a mother trying to fight to protect my own children from abuse. I'm here because I have had the honor of becoming friends with Erica and Wyatt through this effort and so many others along the way. But mostly, honestly, I'm here because I'm so very angry. And I know you are too. I'm angry for what I was left to suffer as an abused child by a system that turned their back on me even after multiple reports of abuse and neglect. I'm angry that at 14 I had to run away from home to save my own life and I lost everything that mattered to me in the process. I'm angry that to this day my abuser has never been charged. I worked so hard to escape that past, but no amount of success or happiness erases what child abuse inflicts. Life may get better, but it's forever different, scarier, and harder than it ever would have been. I was determined to break that cycle of alcoholism and violence that I grew up in when I became a mother. And I did. Yet 12 years of marriage and two beautiful children later, I found myself afraid of the growing alcoholism and aggression in my husband, and I was forced to file for divorce. His threats of violence toward me grew instantly, and my girls witnessed a lot of it. The police, CPS, the court system did not help us. My children were forced to be alone with him for visitations, despite my best efforts to protect them. And without me there to take his anger out on, he did exactly what we were afraid of. He became abusive to them too. I'm angry that we were called liars, even with visible injuries. We were accused of vast conspiracies to ruin him. We were ignored. I'm angry that my children went from happy and outgoing to terrified and hopeless. I watched their innocence stolen and their faith in others destroyed. I'm angry that I had to go into immense debt as a single mother to hire private attorneys just to get the system's attention at all. Taylor's head injury by her father caused a concussion, memory loss, confusion. She went from straight A's to barely hanging on. She lost herself in so many ways and so did her little sister. Finally, he was charged with abuse, a felony. Yet as this process dragged on, the toll on my children was multiplied. Interviews, statements, videotapes, therapists, court dates and cross-examinations, medical evaluations, and his ever-present denial. I'm angry that Andrew Habedink's abuse of my children and the system's failure to act for so long led me to find my precious 14-year-old overdosed on her antidepressants lying on her bedroom floor. I'm angry that my family can never unsee that day. That will be with us forever. Well, he simply gets to walk away. I'm angry that she fought so hard to recover and face him at trial, only to be told two days before that he'd been offered a plea deal, a misdemeanor. They said it was to spare Taylor the pain of testifying. What it did was make my children feel they weren't worth fighting for. I'm angry that he still works, dates, parties, as if his children never existed. His conviction is not even public record. There is no acknowledgement, no remorse. The word sorry was never spoken, not even at his sentencing. I'm angry that I can't warn others about him. I'm angry that his career, clothes, and home will make people think he's a good person, as if those things automatically make you trustworthy. I'm angry there is no Wyatt's Law registry, as I get an online photo of him texted to me by a friend. In that photo, he's with a baby girl. He's smiling, and he's dangerous. But without Wyatt's Law, he's also invisible. I was recently told he moved. I don't know where, somewhere in Michigan. I hope none of you are his new neighbors. 
I can't help but wonder if those opposing this law would feel the same if he were their new neighbor or the new boyfriend a family member brought to a holiday event, if they found out that Rachel Edwards would be moving in next door when she got out of prison. I wonder when I see opposition from someone like Shelley Weisberg of the ACLU. She claims Wyatt's law is a, quote, knee-jerk reaction by lawmakers and a couple people in the public that actually don't do anything to affect child abuse. But I can assure her that this has been a long time coming and a petition nearly 20,000 strong is far from a couple of people. It would be a mistake to discount us. We are not going away. She claims that Wyatt's law mimics the sex abuser registry and they don't support that. Well, Ms. Weisberg, we're inundated with comparisons to the flawed sex offender registry and often hear the arguments about public urination and consensual teen sex as some kind of defense. But until you can show me a case of child abuse where the abuser and the child were consenting or where the abuser never had contact with the child at all, then we would appreciate you not comparing our children's lifelong problems with something so trivial and disrespectful. If what the ACLU actually means is that all public registries are a violation of civil liberties, then perhaps they can explain why innocent children do not deserve their civil liberties. Your mission statement claims you fight for individual liberties, yet you only seem to fight for the abuser in this matter. You object to the cost because, quote, that money would be better used on intervention and prevention. Well, if you have a way to prevent crimes against children, to predict and intervene before they occur, then the entire state of Michigan is all ears. But it sure seems to me that profiling and intrusion would violate quite a few civil liberties as well. I can tell you this much with authority. Children are not resilient. That word is thrown around to tell us things will be okay, like some kind of silver lining after horrific abuse. Children do not forget. Children do not move past it or overcome it. They just learn to live with it. They carry it every day for the rest of their lives, mentally, emotionally, physically, and so do those who love them and who fight to protect them. Those of us living in the wake of these crimes are fighting so that no more have to join us needlessly. This system is broken. We need more. And we're confident that with this information, we can do better for our children than the state of Michigan has been able to do so far. We are angry. We are united. And we will demand why it's law for as long as it takes. And I want to thank each and every one of you for joining in today for a special edition of Silent Voices. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the difference. difference.